Hi, I'm John Corvino. You may have heard the argument that homosexuality is wrong because it's harmful. Of course, this isn't just one argument, it's a whole catalog of arguments. Throughout history, gay people have been blamed for all kinds of disasters. Earthquakes, plagues, famines, Liza Minnelli. Well, we were kind of responsible for that one. Now, I can't address every version of this argument. I'm not going to talk about the crazy idea that gays are pedophiles, which is not just false, but irresponsible because it directs our attention away from the real threats to children. And I'm not going to talk about the idea that same-sex relationships are a threat to traditional marriage, because I've done another video on that. Here I want to talk about the claim that homosexuality is a risky lifestyle. So some people say, well, what about AIDS? Doesn't homosexuality cause AIDS? Um, no. Virus causes AIDS. And that virus can be passed along by homosexual activity, by heterosexual activity, by some activities that aren't sexual at all. Consider the fact that from the standpoint of AIDS risk, it is infinitely more risky for me to have sex with an HIV-positive woman, all else being equal, than with an HIV-negative man. Why? Because it's not the sex that causes the AIDS, it's the virus. And if the virus isn't present, two men can have sex for days without worrying about AIDS. Fatigue? Yes. AIDS? No. Furthermore, if AIDS risk were somehow the barometer for morality, then lesbians would be the most moral people in the world, because from the standpoint of AIDS risk, lesbian sex is the way to go. Think about that headline. Surgeon General recommends lesbianism. There are just too many gaps in this argument. The general idea seems to be that all homosexual sex is risky, all risky activity is immoral, therefore all homosexual sex is immoral. That argument falls apart in two places, the first premise and the second premise. They're both false as written. Some homosexual sex is risky, as is some heterosexual sex, as are some non-sexual activities. Some risky activities are immoral, some aren't. I mean, think about some other examples. Driving is riskier than walking. Football is riskier than chess. Indeed, these activities can both have life-threatening risks sometimes. But we don't conclude that they are always immoral for people to engage in, or that reasonable people should always avoid them. And furthermore, when we're talking about homosexuality, we're not just talking about a game like football. We're talking about the way people experience love and affection. It would be a real deprivation to tell somebody that they could never kiss or caress or have sexual intimacy with the person that they love. But in all of these cases, there are ways that we can minimize the risk, whether we're talking about sex or football or driving. And the response of a morally responsible society is to do just that, to figure out ways to make this safer as opposed to less safe. Now, of course, many people focus not on the risk of disease, but on misery and unhappiness. They talk about how LGBT youth are at a higher risk of suicide, for example. And certainly, that's a real concern. But here, I think their concern is just sort of backwards. And when I think about this, I think about the story of the scientific drunk. The scientific drunk wants to know why he has hangovers, so he starts to keep a journal. And he writes in his journal, Monday night, scotch and soda. Tuesday morning, hangover. Tuesday night, gin and soda. Wednesday morning, hangover. Wednesday night, vodka and soda. Thursday morning, hangover. And he looks back at his journal and says, Aha! Soda causes hangovers. I think when people talk about homosexuality causing despair and suicide, they're pointing at the soda. So what's the alcohol? The alcohol is the mistreatment of gay and lesbian people, which makes our lives more difficult. In fact, the general pattern here is something I like to call the argument of the bully. Imagine a bully on a playground. He knocks down a kid, kid starts crying, teacher comes along and says, hey, why did you hit that kid? The bully says, I hit him because he's crying and it bothers me. The teacher says, wait a second, he's crying because you hit him. The bully says, yeah, and if he keeps crying, I'm going to hit him again. The bully tries to justify his action on the ground that he doesn't like the result of his action. Now think of somebody like, oh, I don't know, Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson says, gay people lead miserable, unhappy lives. And I want to say, uh, and why do you think that might be? Could it have anything to do with the kinds of lies that you're spreading about us? In fact, the striking thing is that despite these challenges, we have so many nice examples of happy, healthy, well-adjusted LGBT people. If we really want to focus on harm and risk, we should talk about the harm that bigotry does to LGBT people. 
we should talk about the devastating effects of the closet, the isolation and loneliness, the wasted talent and energy. We should talk about those who wield morality as a weapon, telling young people in the formative time of their life that there's something sick and unnatural and wrong with them because of whom they love. To the extent that homosexuality is a risky lifestyle, it's because these people are putting us at risk. You know, if there's something perverse or twisted here, it's that we experience hate because of whom we love. We experience violence because of the affection that exists in our lives. And the effects of that treatment are a far greater moral tragedy than sex between consenting adults could ever be.